Society grows great when old men plant trees that they know they shall never sit in the shade of. That is long-term planning for the benefit of the community. And that is what my talk today is basically about. In 1998, the Cayman Islands government started the Vision 2008 initiative, which was a planning exercise consisting of 16 strategies that looked at various areas of society and the economy. Hundreds of people signed up to sit on the round tables and they gave hundreds of hours over a period of six months to having input in it. However, of the 16 strategies, only four ever got implemented. And I therefore argue that for some reason, the Cayman Islands dislikes long-term planning. I have started calling the Cayman Islands the Isles of Complacency. Government has an obligation to plan ahead in the long term for the benefit of its residents. Caymanians of years ago planned ahead. They had to, because that ensured their survival. We had a shipbuilding industry, and our expert shipwrights worked from three-dimensional plans. You can see Captain Rail Bodden in the picture holding a 3D model of a ship that he would proceed to build. Elroy Arch built another interesting ship the name of which was the Western Union, and it was built for the company of the same name, the Western Union Telegraph Company. And this was a cable-laying ship. It was planned and fitted together here in Cayman. Then it was disassembled and shipped to Key West, where it was then reassembled and planked and launched eventually. This took a lot of planning. The first dive shop in the Cayman Islands and one of the early ones in the region was started by Bob Soto, a completely new industry. Bob was a forward thinker and a planner he is no longer with us, unfortunately, but the industry he started has gone from strength to strength. We had people like Dr. Roy McTaggart, who, if my memory serves me correctly, developed the first large bank building in Georgetown for Barclays Bank on Cardinal Avenue. Where are the plans for the next four decades. I certainly haven't seen any. I have written a few, but I have not seen any adopted by the powers that be. We're going to have to be dealing with climate change, sea level rise, economic competition, both in tourism and offshore finance, issues such as employment, or unemployment, I should say, and the need for public housing. There are plans afoot, I understand, to extend the runway at Owen Roberts International Airport. I've seen talk of adding a thousand feet on the west end of the runway, which unfortunately would disrupt a major arterial road. Long-term thinking should be looking further into the future, and it may behoove us to add 3,000 feet 
onto the east end of the runway, which would allow us to have direct long-haul flights in years to come from the European Union, from the Persian Gulf, and from China, Korea, or Japan. It would also enable us to handle new and larger aircraft. Recently, in Bermuda, the Royal Gazette, the main newspaper there, published an article suggesting that Malta, an island in the Mediterranean, was trying to lure Bermuda's reinsurance industry to relocate to Valletta, Malta. This brings to my mind the question of who may be trying to take our business through offering more efficient service, a more business-friendly environment. We should be constantly re-examining what we're doing and how it relates to what our competitors, both regional and global, are doing. We will have, by the end of the century, by 2100, at least one meter, or 3.28 feet, of sea level rise. This, unfortunately, is locked in. And it could be more, unfortunately, unless we can keep the global average temperature under 1.5 degrees Celsius over what it was prior to the Industrial Revolution, we could see more sea level rise. Now, obviously, that is dependent on how much carbon dioxide we pump into the atmosphere. But if you look in the lower left corner, you will see almost 3,000 buildings, or almost 10% of the buildings in the Cayman Islands in 2008, when that map was made, will be sitting in varying depths of water. Since then, obviously, more buildings have been constructed, and that will raise that total probably somewhat over 3,000 buildings. Where is our plan for mitigation? Has anybody seen one? There again, I have not. Here we have an interesting picture. Three category four cyclones at the same time in the Pacific. This was in 2015. More recently, we've had Cyclone Winston with sustained winds of 184 miles per hour, a new record for the South Pacific. 2015, was the hottest year in recorded history. As you will see, the large major areas of red, which indicate higher temperatures, are mainly in the Arctic, which means that Greenland is going to be losing more and more ice, which contributes to sea level rise. Alternative energy is one of the answers. We cannot stop it but we can perhaps mitigate it to a certain extent. Solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal cooling, all of these cut down the carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. Recently, we've seen many articles in the media about unemployment. And I query, are we in fact equipping school leavers with the skills they need to find employment. If we are not, we are letting them down, and we are letting society down. What is the cost, the long-term cost, of young people who cannot find employment? Could it be a larger prison population? a larger police force, more 
closed-circuit television cameras, more crime, and declining tourism. It is in our best interest to fix the problem with education now, rather than do all these other unpleasant things later. Finland, and I am not in the education field, but they are alleged to have an outstanding education system. Perhaps we should be looking around the world for better systems. The elephant in the room, our constitutional status. I have no opinion, really, one way or the other, whether we stay as a colony or go independent. Citizens will decide, eventually, what is the right thing to do. However, in the meantime, we should be upgrading our skills, the skills of our senior civil servants. We should be equipping them with the knowledge to properly run a country of their own. Who knows, at some point in the future, we may have a new political party, and they might want to lead us towards independence. And being prepared and having people that can, in fact, perform a good job of governance could be looked at as insurance. Another thing we can do, which Bermuda did about three years ago, they seconded senior civil servants, I think it was two of them, to the European Commission to obtain experience in another country. I think this was an excellent idea and in fact congratulated the Premier in Bermuda on this initiative. Other good things would be attendance at the Wilton Park Conference Centre. Wilton Park is an offshoot of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and they put on somewhere in the vicinity of 50 conferences a year. They're residential conferences, usually four days, you live on property. And I've been to a lot of conferences around the world, in The Hague, in London, in Brussels, but the Wilton Park conferences are outstanding and better than any other I have been to. That would give our civil servants a huge advantage in running a country or just in day-to-day -day governance. The contacts you make at these things as well are just as good as the actual content of the conference. You meet people from all walks of life, from diplomats, members of parliament, military officers, academics, and uh, it's just a fantastic experience. Recently, there was an article in the Compass saying that average room rates in Cayman are higher than the region, and occupancy is down. This is something that renewable energy could help if they were able to use more solar, more wind, more geothermal. We could make our hotel rates more competitive. And I query why, as James Whitaker was saying early in his presentation, why we're not pushing in that direction a great deal harder. In Europe, a number of countries are looking at what a lot of people still think, I, th I believe, is a strange concept, and that is minimum basic income. For instance, in Finland, they are thinking about, and I think going to implement on a small scale to begin with, giving each citizen 850 euros per month. No requirement to work, no means testing, but as a citizen, that is their share of the country's wealth. Other U European countries are also testing this on a small scale. The Netherlands is doing so, and Switzerland is talking about it. 
And in fact, Switzerland is talking about a figure of 2,700 Swiss francs per month. It is something I think we should look at here. People, people will throw their hands in the air and say, oh, we can't afford it. But as I mentioned earlier, when you look at costs of not fixing some of these systems, it may not be that out of line. Housing. Housing is very expensive here. And like much of the world, houses seem to be a great deal bigger than they need to be, certainly bigger than a starter home may be. And there is quite a movement around the world in utilizing shipping containers, either as small individual houses or parts, when used together, of a larger house, as you see in the picture. I think it would be quite feasible for a small basic container home on a small plot of land to be under $75,000. Good thing about containers, they're very strong. Hurricanes would not bother them. Thinking again of training our civil service, the National University of Singapore has a Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. It is excellent. It is based on the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and in fact was helped to set it up by Harvard Kennedy. Singapore, ex-British colony, had independence given to them. I think they demanded it in 1963. And the man that pushed for that was Lee Kuan Yew, their first prime minister and the prime minister for many years, who unfortunately passed a few years ago. He was a man of vision, and he made Singapore into a center of excellence. As he said, he gave his life to guide and build his country. And he always stressed to his team the power of strategic thinking, seeing around the bend ahead. He was always willing to assume risk to move Singapore ahead. Singapore built a million units of public housing of different sizes and different prices but 80% of Singaporeans live in these publicly built houses. 80% own their own apartments. And the interesting thing is, Singapore has a higher GDP per capita than the Cayman Islands. To succeed, we must understand our place in the world, create and articulate a vision, passionately own the vision, and drive it to completion. A researcher at the Palo Alto Research Park in California in 1971 said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Let us, therefore, go forth and invent the future that these islands so desperately need. Because failure is not an option. Thank you.